Lovely to be with you here in the lifeboat. It's been a little while since I was with you, but I want to thank all of you. Many have been praying for us uh, during the COVID pandemic that came, and uh, many of you had suffered it, and I certainly was well swept off my feet with it. But I'm grateful to God that I'm well recovered and getting back into the work again and preaching a little and ministering to people. So I'm very grateful, and thank you to all of those who have prayed for us. We really appreciate that. Prayer is a very powerful tool, and it really does work, and you should engage in it. And if you haven't an appetite for it, which is very common, unfortunately, among Christians, then you need to ask God, well, Lord, why do I not have an appetite? What's wrong with me? And if you start to ask the right questions, then God, if you give him time, he'll tell you. And he'll show you things in your life he doesn't like. And he'll uh, give you the ability to repent. And when you repent and you start to do what God wants to do, then you'll find God will become more real to you. And the more you do that in your life, the more real God will become until he, he's really a good friend to you. And uh, it's wonderful to know the Lord, and it's lovely to be here tonight. Uh, to share the Word of God. Now, uh, we want to turn in our Bibles, uh, please, to Psalm 8. Psalm 8. And uh, or as a young convert said to me, I've been reading the Psalms uh, lately. So uh, it's not the Psalms, it's the Psalms. And we're going to do number 8. It's a very short Psalm, and it's very beautiful, and really exalts and glorifies the Lord. So let's, let's read this together, Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou hast made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air and the fish of the seas, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Turn over with me, please, to the book of Jude. The little book of Jude, if you get to Revelation, the last book of the Bible, and turn back, you'll get one little book, and there's just one chapter, and it's called the General Epistle to Jude. And we're just going to read two verses that will be relevant to what we're going to be talking about this evening. Jude and verse 6. Jude is just the one chapter and the verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, God hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. This is speaking about a judgment that God brought just uh, prior to the flood. And whenever God took the angels who were watchers, that was their job, they were to watch the earth and return and give information regarding what was going on in the earth, but they overstepped their mark. They went beyond the boundaries that God had set for them, and what they did was they came down to earth, and they took human form, and they had uh, sexual relations with women, and from those relations came giants the, called the Nephilim, and those giants roamed the earth. And there's much evidence uh, in archaeology of the giants. And these uh, particular beings were hybrids. That means they were half demonic and half human. 
And it's interesting in the last days that Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. Now, I haven't time to go into it, but I have read it at great length and found it very fascinating that there is much going on in laboratories, and uh, both in the military and in the world of science, where many suspect that the hybrids are already being created, where demonic power is being drawn upon to give, as it were, they call super soldiers. Now, I'm not uh, saying that I go with every theory, but I find it interesting that the Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. These were hybrids. And uh, immediately after they were born and they began to inhabit the earth, then violence, the world went mad. And God said, I can't put up with man anymore. And then the flood came. In like manner, we're told, uh, those of us who are familiar with the Scripture, is that God will come again in judgment on the earth. And there are many things lining up uh, just at the very present moment we're speaking. I don't know if anybody's aware of uh, what was happening in Israel just over the last few days. That I think it was from Germany they have brought in the red heifer. The red heifer was manufactured, as it were, in Germany. And it was brought to Israel just a few days ago. And they had celebrations, and the Jewish uh, people, uh, many of them the um, religious Jews, as it were, uh, and Orthodox Jews were all rejoicing and blowing the shofar because the sacrifice for the temple has come. And Jesus said that the temple will be built. He told us 2,000 years ago this event would occur, and the Jews are doing it. They have the temple ready for, for building once they get the site cleared for it. Momentous days that we're living in. Momentous. Homosexuality spreading over the whole earth. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be. Now, let's see, let's see what the Bible has to say about that in verse 7, in uh, Jude verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. You see the similarity where people go beyond what God intended. That's, that's the, what Jude's talking about. The angels went beyond what God intended, and they went, came to the women, and then terrible sin and judgment came. In like manner, homosexuality was the problem here. Men went beyond what God intended. It was beyond the order that God had established when he created men and women. I know this is not popular today, and if I was in certain countries, I would probably be lynched and go to jail, but it's the truth of God. It's the truth of God. And friends, the Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. Don't let go of the truth, because the truth sets people free. Even as they give themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Amen. And we know God will bless the public reading of his infallible and his inerrant word. Let's unite in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your precious and living word to guide us. We thank you that the Lord Jesus is the living word. He's the word in flesh, and he has come. And we thank you, Lord, we can sing like the, like the hymn writer when he said, you ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. And we thank you for the living Christ inside a redeemed heart. We pray tonight, Lord, for the help of the Holy Spirit. I ask that you will anoint, Lord, uh, this message. I pray that you will take all of me, cleanse and sanctify me, and fill me with the Holy Spirit. And I pray for every needy heart, from the youngest child to the oldest adult, that the Holy Spirit will do that work that no preacher can do in bringing men to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus. We ask it. And we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to jump in for the sake of time to the psalm which speaks of the majesty, the might, the power of God. And I want to consider simply one verse in Psalm 8. It's the verse 3. It's the verse 3. 
and the verse 4 as well. We're going to take the two of them. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, and the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? What is man? That's the question. <laughs> what a question. What is man? You know, so often we're busy in life and we have this to do and that to do and work and family and bills and it's all so busy. We often don't take time to sit down and reflect. That's what biblical meditation is very important by taking the Word of God and just thinking about it and letting it soak into your soul and let the truth of God get into your heart. And here the psalmist, of course, is conveying the greatness of God, and then he's bringing out the smallness, as it were, of man in comparison. But we want to take these words of David, and we want to think about them. What is man? Now, you and I have a great advantage tonight to this question because we're all men and women. That is, we have inside information. <laughs> we have that. What is a man? Well, the secular world today, if you speak to the man who doesn't bother with God so much or think that that's really something for the past, and if you're not enlightened, you uh, then uh, believe in God. But if you've been enlightened and educated, then you believe that God is, or man is simply a body with a mind. That's it. And once you die, the brain cells eventually stop flickering and the neurons stop moving and you're gone. And that's it. Now, of course, from a Christian perspective, we completely reject that, but we have many reasons. Christianity is a very logical religion. It requires the supernatural, but it's logical. It's not illogical. There are many religions and they're illogical. They don't make sense. Let's take one example. I was speaking recently to a friend of mine who's a converted Roman Catholic. And I'd been talking to another man about it, and I was saying, you know, whenever, and I'm speaking respectfully, I'm not here to mock or, or, or offend my Roman Catholic neighbors, but I'm just bringing out a point. Christianity is logical. But I was saying about, you know, whenever a person dies, then there are things called mass cards. And those mass cards are, if the priest signs them, then you give in money. I don't know what his signature does to assist, but it, I think it's a little bit more expensive if you have the priest's signature. And these are paid for, and the purpose of them is to assist the person who has died and has gone to a place which is non-existent in the Bible. It's a place called purgatory, where the flames of hell, as it were, are burning off the latter sins of the life to get the person into heaven. That's the general belief. So the individuals, when that person dies, they will have masses for them. Uh, there will be a month's mass will be carried out in the local chapel for them in their name, and then money will be offered. This is all to help and assist in the salvation or deliverance of the soul. I was asking my friend, what happens whenever a person has been overgiven? You give, say, a thousand pounds, but it only took 950 to get them out. What happens to the other 50? Does it transfer to another relative that didn't have enough? Or does God ever look down and say about a relative that was lost, you know, two or three generations ago, they're not prayed for, they're forgotten now. So, so you talk to God and God said, well, if I'd have got another hundred quid, they would have been out, but they're in. But then the other co uh, contradiction is this, that in most Roman Catholic churches, the priest will find himself saying, in the event of the death of the individual, out of just courtesy, he'll say that they're in heaven. That doesn't make sense. How come you can be in heaven and then you start praying for them and paying for them to get them out of purgatory? It's, con it's not logical. It doesn't make sense. And it's happening every day. Christianity is not like that. It's not like that. 
You see, my dear friends, we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. We are tripart beings. We are made in the image of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are a reflection of the divine. We are not divine. We are lesser than divine. We are shorter and lesser than the angels, the Bible says, simply because angels have the capacity to be in the presence of God like Gabriel, who is ever in the presence of God. And then he came and he took a human form or some form that was, was uh, recognized by Mary. And he said to Mary, I am come to tell you about the birth of the Messiah. You're going to be, have, have a son. And then he went back into the presence of God. Humans don't have that capacity. We're lower than the angels. But I have good news for you. That's going to turn around. Whenever we die or the Lord returns, we'll get a body like unto his glorious body. And I have no idea what we'll be able to do, but I can tell you, we'll be doing a lot, an awful lot more and doing it better than what we do here now. Well, the body is an interesting and a very complex machine. We're told that the vessels in our body, blood vessels all through our body, if they were all joined together, they would go around the earth twice. That's complex. Every second in your body, there are two million red blood cells being made. Every second. It just happens even though you're not thinking about it. I lift my arm just now to scratch my head. Very simple action. We all do it and other things like it, that simple action, the scientists of the world, the greatest geniuses, have no idea how that happens. They have no idea how that I did that. Because of the complexity of the brain, the body, the muscles, so on and so forth. What is man? Man is very complex. He's very complex. We like to simplify things, but we don't live in a simple world. This world is not simple. The answers to life are not simple. And every one of us tonight could be saying inside, why did that happen? How did that happen? It's natural. We're in a complex world, and we have certainly a complex body. In recent years, the scientists discovered DNA. DNA is essentially the book of life. There are three billion letters in this book. And those three billion letters are required to make you who you are. Atheists first believed that because man is made of cells, cells are so simple, so small, so finite, so tiny, that, that's how, my, you know, they're just little nothings, only to discover that they're so complex that scientists can't get to the bottom of them. Three billion letters. And those three billion letters have to be in perfect order, otherwise you'll not be who you are. If letters mix up, not only is there three billion letters forming a book which is the size of a library, that's just the book to make you, inside one cell, your DNA, but the information that comes from each letter and each section of letters tells the rest how to make the next bit. It is mind-boggling. You see, to say that God doesn't exist is to say that a book the size of a library that's all legible and all readable, all that book and books fell from the sky, nobody made them, and you go into the library and you get so much information that all makes sense and you read it and you say, that all fell from the sky, by the way. That's what you've got to believe if you're an atheist. 
You see, my dear friends, in the answer to the question, what is man? Man is an entity. Man is a unique being made in the image of God. And the image of God is reflected in what I'm going to take as three simple evidences of you and I made in his image. Number one, we are creative. We are all creative. Look at this world today. Look at the building we're in. Look at the house you live in. Look at the motor car you drove. We are creative. Now, where man can, what he cannot do is he cannot create something out of nothing. Man hasn't that ability. That's divine. God does that. But man can create from what is. Look at the bridges. Look at the buildings. Look at the computers. Look at the clocks. My dear friends, you see it. The creative power and genius of man. This is simply a reflection of the one who created him, the great mind behind the world, the great creator, God, the God of the Jews. We are creative. But here's another thing. We all have a sense of justice. We all sense something of right and wrong. You find it in every culture, Christian or non-Christian, peoples that have never ever heard the gospel or heard of God, yet it is there, there is this thing that is aligned to us, but we can disobey it. It's not something that we just naturally obey like a law, but it's a law, it's like, it's like a measuring rod that's down over our life, and, and, and when we go to do something, somehow this rod seems to pull us to a certain way, and we know we ought to do the right, and even when we do the wrong, then we regret doing the wrong because we know inside we should have done the right. What is that right? Where does that right come from? The sense of justice. Whenever a pedophile is caught abusing a child, well, I was going to say automatically, but the way the world's going, my, brother, my son was telling me about now they're having a particular new group to join the LGBT, MNOP, whatever it is. And they're called MAPS, Minor Attraction Personality. It's the natural flow. Pedophilia will have to come in if a person says, I'm an adult, but I have the heart of a child. I need to be with a child. What's the laws of the country going to do? Well, you know where they've gone already. It's only a matter of time before pedophilia will be accepted. It's only a matter of time. Once you open the door to hell and the devil, my dear friends, it's hard to close. It's hard to close. Once the nation embraces darkness and switches off all the lights of God's commandments, it's hard for light to come again. But in our present company and in many normal people, there is the expectation if someone abuses a child, they should be taken and punished. And that's right. Why is it right? Because God has put it in us. The law of justice, the law of righteousness, the law of truth and right and wrong, it comes from the divine, from no other source. What is man? Man is a creative being. Man is a being of justice. But he's also a spiritual being. He's a spiritual being. There is something inside the heart of man that can never be satisfied with everything that this world can give him. And for those of you dear Christians tonight who are still worldly, 
and are still taken up with the trinkets and toys of the world, and they're very much to the forefront of your life. I want to tell you that you're running after a mirage. I want to tell you that you're being duped and you're being robbed. We often have sung it and sung it here, now none but Christ can satisfy. And dear friend, when you encounter the living God, the creator of the material world, you would expect, wouldn't you, that the one who made it, who is all glorious and all wonderful and all powerful and all knowing, if you had an interview with him and you were in his presence and his courts, it wouldn't be very long until you would say, I'm not worried with the trinkets of the world because I found the author. But perhaps you haven't met the author enough. Perhaps you haven't sought him enough. And so you walk in the lowlands. In the lowlands spiritually, when God would want you to be on the mountaintops. Where you could see him and hear him and sense him. That's where he would want you. And it is only by the grace of the Holy Spirit and by the love and grace of God the Father and God the Son that that is possible. But it is possible, my friend. We are spiritual beings made in the image of the triune God, the God of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Jews. Jesus Christ, when he was on earth, he said to the Samaritans and others, he said, salvation is of the Jews. And whether you're a Muslim or whatever religion you're from, Hinduism, salvation to the soul is from the Jews. The Ten Commandments, the laws of Moses, and then the words of Jesus the Messiah, the God-man who came to earth and died for us on the cross to bear our sin. Oh, my friends, we are not merely material beings but spiritual. And this, for many of us who are Christians tonight, we observed this in our own conversion, didn't we? We became aware at that time in our life whenever the emptiness of the world. We saw through it to some degree. We recognized the limitations of it, that death was was looming before us. At some stage, the reaper death would come and we'd be swept away. And God gave us enough light to recognize we were sinners and we repented and put our trust in the Lord. Oh yes, we're spiritual beings. I recently had a young lady came to see me. She rang me and her father actually rang and then she rang and came to see me. And when she came, a very nice young girl in her early 20s. And she said to me, I was brought up in the church. But sadly, for many young people, the church is not real. It's all formality, and there's no reality. And as a result, she said, you know, it wasn't too long till I got away from God again. And I did things I shouldn't have done, and so on and so forth. But she said, I had a great fascination about knowing about the future. And so on the internet, she said, I got in touch with some psychics. And she said, I paid them a lot of money, and they told me my future. And they told me the things that would happen in my life. And she said, then I felt I wanted a wee bit of power in my life. And she said, I got in touch with a witch in England. And she said, she sent me over a lot of materials, and I had to do these things with these materials. She said, I didn't do them all because I got a bit spooked out when I saw what she sent me. Paying for it, mind you, paying for it. (laughs) Salvation's free. King of glory will come into your life. But there you are, deceived and dabbling with the devil. But she said, I didn't get what I asked for. She said, dark figures started to appear in the bedroom. And she said, they weren't for going. And then she said, they started to hit me. And beat me and scratch me in my bed. And she says, that's why I'm here. 
She said, I need God. I need God. See, she's a spiritual being. There's no point in bringing her to the psychiatrist. There's no point in bringing some boy with a degree in psychology. No good. You need the power of the blood of Jesus. And thank God that night she put her trust in the Lord. And she wasn't hard to get to repent of all the stuff she had done. And she knew there was a God and knew there was a devil, I can tell you. My dear friends, if these simple truths that we read every day and think about, if they could only get a hold of us, if these truths could just burn into our soul and mind by the Holy Spirit, oh, what different Christians we would be. Oh, how our lives would be so different. Oh, yes, we're spiritual beings. Absolutely. But my dear friends, I want to tell you, not only is our spirit open to dark entities, that's the very core of our being. Our spirit is open to dark. It can be open to good. Because there's a God in heaven who rules over all. And the devil, as I remember many years ago, sitting up in a little prayer meeting up the road there, and the late Clarence Wallace prayed, and he said something, and it has always stuck in my mind. And he prayed, Lord, the devil is but a leaf in your wind. That's so true. Don't underestimate him. But he can't be compared with God. God's all powerful. He's everything. Let's move on very quickly. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him. Hmm. Visiting. Here David is thinking about God, the great creator, visiting this being called man. Now that word visit is quite complex and therefore I'm not going to even attempt to describe all that it means. But I'm taking three pointers that have been drawn to my attention regarding what the word visit means. And the first one is to visit, to care for. God visits to care for. You find that, of course, in the book of Genesis when God made man and man's just created and God's with them and they're having great fellowship for every day. The Lord Jesus comes God in the form of man comes and he meets every evening they come in the cool of the day and they talk. And I would love to have listened in to what they talked about. And no doubt Adam has been working during the day. He's been working with the plants. No weeds, mind you, thank God. But he's been working in, in, in not just a wee garden either like something in your uh, a wee acre. It's a country. He's got a country God gave him. Five rivers flowing through it. Big ones. I want to tell you, my friends, God's generous. <laughs> you just don't believe that. God's generous. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. That's his promise. God's good. God's good. Adam's in the garden, and no doubt he's working at a plant, and he thinks to himself, I wonder how that was made. This is just me thinking now. I'll see the Lord later on tonight. <laughs> the Lord comes, I was working at that plant there. How did you make that? We're inquisitive beings, you know. And we'll always be inquisitive. My children said to me when they were a lot younger, they said to me, Dad, I don't know whether I want to go to heaven. I just, oh, I got a shock. I says, why not? They said, we might get bored. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? I get bored in it. Like if you had to go to meetings like this for eternity, it would, I mean, it would certainly have an effect on me. And I, I'm very fond of all of you. I'm no offense taken. But you know, you need more. <laughs> and I said to them, well, the problem 
That problem never happens because God eternally will unveil himself. God's always revealing himself. Sure, isn't that the Christian life? Look back over your life how God revealed himself. That's what it'll be for eternity. There'll never be an end. You'll never get to a stage I know everything about God. It'll happen eternally. God unveiling himself. Can't happen. You're bored on earth, but not in heaven. God cares. God would have talked to him. God provided for him. God met his need. <laughs> so we sing it sometimes. I have a shepherd, one I love so well. How he has blessed me. Tongue can never tell. Do we sing that? Do we? A couple of months ago, I was driving up the road, and the wife was in beside me in the car, and she's a good wee lady, sweet Scottish lady. Better say that in case she watched the recording. We were driving up the road, and she says to me, just out of the blue, we have three pounds in the account. But mind you, when you have three children, like Alsatians at the cupboards, and all the bills, never mind the new electric bills. Three pounds is not, not good news. Well, we said, well, the Lord has been faithful for the last 30 years. 30 years. So, she will just ask him. Lord, you know there's three pounds. That's it. It's up to you, Lord. You said you're our father. You said if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that everything will be added. Next morning, the wife will get up. I knew three pounds wouldn't buy very much for me to eat. And I like food. And ting came on the phone. Ting on the phone. Thousand pound. From a wee church in Wales. She says to me, how did a thousand pound? I says, it just came through there. So she made off and got her groceries or whatever. Next morning, I rang the wee church. Lovely folk, small home church that are committed to serving the Lord. Just a handful of people, but love the Lord. I rang and I said, uh, listen, I just wanted to say thank you so much for, for what you sent. That you, you have no idea that. Really, that was of God. She said, well, actually, there was a little lady in the church, and she prays a lot and seeks the Lord, and she contacted me, and she said, send 1,000 pounds to Alan and Rachel. And she says, well, that's all right. We'll do that. She says, no, send it now. God told me, send it now. I have a shepherd, one I love so well. How he has blessed me, tongue can never tell. On the cross he suffered, shed his blood and died. Hey, dear friend, it's wonderful to have a shepherd. Yes, yes he, he visits us to care for us. God visits to care. He knows every detail about you, by the way. Don't be thinking there's anything special about me. There's not. There's no, wind, there's no wings or anything in the air, Don. Just an ordinary guy. Just ordinary. No different to you. You have the same Savior, same blood, same spirit. The youngest convert that comes to the Lord, they have as much rights to the throne as I have. No privileges. He's open to you too. Not only does he visit to care for us, but in the verses we read in Jude, he visits to judge. And my dear friends, I say this not with any joy, but sorrow in my heart. As I see things unfolding in our country, as I th see things going down the tube, as I see basic basic anatomical or, or basic biological truths that are, that are set and have been set from creation turned on their head, turned on their head, not only by oddballs. There's always oddballs in the country. There's always these queer people that have weird beliefs. So every society is those but now, my friends, the queer society has become the majority of society. 
the intellectuals, the government, the people in high places. You say, well, what's going to happen? Well, there's one of two things going to happen for the country. I'm not a prophet nor son of a prophet. It's going to either be the mercy of God in revival or judgment or both. God says of Ju in Jude, he said, Sodom and Gomorrah is set forth as an example. In other words, God said, I took this region with all the cities and the primary sin, there was many, but the primary one was homosexuality was just rife in the whole place. And even poor Lot had to bring the angels in for he was afraid they would be raped. And of course, that's exactly what was happening. It, they, they got so, not only were they homosexual, but then it went beyond that where they, where they literally were going to rape these angels because the demons of homosexuality, those demons that drive that behavior, they wanted to take these angels even when the men were blinded. You see, dear friends, God says, I have set it forth as an example. And you could imagine, you can imagine that that city and those cities with all their flags, all the flags flying of the rainbow, and all the politicians standing out at the front applauding. We have passed these laws. Yeah, absolutely. Got to get rid. You see this old lot boy, this guy that talks about God and the Bible. You've got to silence this guy. You can't have this. This guy will have to go to prison. Because if persecution comes to the church, by the way, this is what it's going to be through. It's going to be through this issue. That's where it's coming. And you'll not be getting support from the government anymore for taxes or anything in the church. They'll see to it that it's all gone. They will kill the church if they can. Because it's not people that we're dealing with. It's principalities and powers that want to suffocate the light of God and the truth of the gospel from the land. But the devil has a wonderful way of overstepping himself. Just when he feels he has the lid on it, God blows the lid off very often. And as all the celebrating was going on and the flags were waving and people probably walking the way they were walking down Belfast and Uri and Mid-Ulster and the way they behaved and families bringing out their wee children to see men naked walking up and down the street, I wonder what's wrong with these parents? What's wrong with them? Who would bring a wee child out to see that? She you have to be perverted yourself. You would see of a child, any wee child you would save them from seeing things like that. Even the very BBC have to do it until 8 o'clock. But that's where we are. And that's where they were, my friend, in downtown Sodom. And God said, I've had enough. It wasn't, it wasn't Lot that dealt with it, and it mightn't be the church is able to do anything about it, but my friends, make no mistake, God visits iniquity. God visited, and a fire came from heaven, the Bible says, and if you went to that region to this day, you will see the little balls of sulfur that are still there where nothing grows, and it's one of the few locations on the face of the earth where there are sulfur balls that indicate fire came in the form of sulfur balls onto that region. God said, I set it forth as an example. I have warned humanity. I have warned humanity, judgment will come. My dear friend, the thing that you need to fear more than anything else is God and sin. And if you don't fear either of those, you're in trouble. You're in trouble, and you're on a collision course with the one who has never lifted a flag. You're on a collision course with the God who can remove your soul from your body and plant it quicker than you could think of in a place the Bible calls hell, which I believe is the center of the earth. But that's another, that's for another night. Yeah. You see, we all believe sin has to be punished, don't we? Down deep, we know wrong should be, but we don't believe it should happen to us. 
Uh, but that's, that's, you see, you're the wrong measuring stick. You're measuring yourself with your own stick. Measure yourself by God's stick. And you'll find things are not good. Because when you break the law of God, you're guilty. And when you're guilty, then you're under sentence. When you're under sentence, then you're going to go to God's courtroom. When you go to God's courtroom and the evidence is pulled out of the sin that you've committed, then God says there's only one thing, and that is guilty. That's why you need a Savior. You see, my dear friends, in closing, not only does God come as to care for us, not only does he come to punish, but he comes to bestow grace. That's part of his visiting. It is to bestow grace. You know, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. The grace. Do you know what grace is? Grace is me getting from God what I don't deserve. There's many religious people in our country tonight, Protestant and Roman Catholic, and they know that they don't deserve salvation, but what they're doing is they're praying and paying for it. They're working for it. They're doing good deeds. They're going about it all the wrong way. You see, it's grace. It's grace. By grace, you're saved. It's the mercy of God. It's God simply saying, you don't deserve anything, but I am giving it. It's nothing to do with you. It's all God. It's all His mercy. It's all His love. It's all Him being benevolent to mankind. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. My dear friends, as we draw to a close, you are a sinner in the sight of God as am I. You've committed sin, you've broke the law of God, and therefore you're guilty. And what you're doing tonight, if you're not a Christian, if you have never put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, then tonight you are walking about with a stick of dynamite, and the little fuse is in it, and you're enjoying life just like the fuse. And all the little sparkle and tinsel out of all you're doing and all your little things you want to do in life, that's the little tinsel that you're... But the tinsel's going down. It's going down. And you're trying uh, immorality and you're having fornicating with people and there's pornography and there's all types of things and, and you're being deceitful and lying and untruthful and, and you don't treat people right and you don't treat your parents right. And, and there's a thousand things that you know, and, but you're just going on and you're living your life in the little fuse is just burning up, burning up, burning. But you know what happens, my friend, when you hold on to that fuse that seems to excite and the tinsel of it really excites you in your life? That one moment, my friends, once that hits the stick, then your soul and your spirit and your body are blown apart. It's what the Bible calls death. The wages of sin is death where your soul and spirit are separated and all is left is a body, a frame, a tent that held that together. That's all that's left. And you're gone. But the Bible says, man dieth and wasteth away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost. But where is he? That's the question. Where is he? My dear friends, it was God's intention and his plan before ever you were born or before ever your grandparents or going back even to Adam before that, God knew about you. I believe that. God says that. That shows how important you are. God knew about you before the foundation of the world. And God says, I love you so much that I'm going to do something for you. And in the councils of Eternity, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit communed. And a great plan was brought forth that God would send his wonderful beloved Son 
And he would restrict and lay aside all his glory, majesty, and power. He would lay it all aside and voluntarily go into the womb of a virgin. And there he would be contracted to a span and become a little infant thing that would cry. And the hymn writer said, Lo, within the manger lies he who made the starry skies. And he would live a sinless life, but at the age of 33, he would be taken, and there he would voluntarily be nailed to an old cross, naked, beaten, and bludgeoned, and spat upon, and his brow eh, broken. And there he would lie, and then they would lift up that old cross. And the one who clothed the earth with water, with land, with grass, he, the creator, would hang naked. Why? Why did he do this? My friend, it was for you. It was for you he did it. It was for you he did it. And you did it for you. He died the just for the unjust to bring us to God. And on that cross, he cried, finish. You say, Alan, how would I become a Christian? How would I come to know this God you have spoke of tonight? This wonderful being, how would I know him? Well, my dear friend, you must acknowledge your sin. You must come to God and acknowledge, I am a sinner. I have broken the law of God. I am guilty. And bring your sin to him. Come as a sinner in your sinnerhood. Come to him, God, I am lost. I am broken. I am undone. I am guilty. I deserve your judgment and your wrath for I have broken your law. But oh, I, I plead for mercy. And as you draw near to him, he'll call you to repentance. And you say, God, I'm turning with all my heart, with the best, the best I can. I turn, but I need your power, Lord. And he'll give you power. He'll give you power to turn from sin. He'll enable you to overcome sin. But as many as received him, to them give he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. He promises power. And put your trust in him. Put your trust in him. Forty years ago, I remember going to a tent. Doesn't seem that long ago. Forty years sounds big, but it's not that long ago. As a teenager. And I can remember sitting in that tent. And the Holy Spirit began to show me who I was and who God was and who Christ was. And as a teenager, I bowed my heart. I said, God, I'm a sinner. I deserve judgment. I know I'm dark inside. I know the things I have thought and the things I have done. I know there's no light in me. I'm dark. But I, I need, Lord, if what this preacher said is true and that you love me and that Christ died for me, then, Lord, I'm coming just as a sinner. That's all I can do. Just come. I have nothing good. I have no money. I have nothing to present. I'm guilty. I'm a sinner. But I come to you pleading your mercy. And my dear friends, mercy was found. Mercy was found. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have peace in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. Oh, friend, let him in. Let him in. Why would you keep him out? I have tried to present him tonight. I have attempted in a very feeble manner to tell you a little of how he, how he works and what he does and how good he is. How feeble I've been. But oh, I trust the Holy Spirit will make what I have said so much clearer and that he'll magnify it in your mind and heart. 
and that even if you leave this place without Christ, I pray that the Holy Spirit will follow you. I pray that if you put your head on your pillow tonight, that the Holy Spirit will continue to speak to you. And he will tell you that you need to come to him. Oh, do it, my friend. Do it, my friend. What is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou visitest him? Let's bow in prayer.